Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm just um, we're just sort of like getting everybody connected uh, and properly um, admitted. So just bear with us. So that's why I'm starting a little bit early. Okay. Alrighty, so <laughs> Professor Mayen, Dean Mayen is joining us. And he's our guest of honor, so that's the most important person, the VIP. Uh, everyone uh, else is filing in. James, do you hear me? I can. It won't let me sh open my video. Uh, oh, hold on. I may have to um, allow you to do that. All right. Uh, make it. Oh. Um, okay, so I made you a co-host, and I think that should allow you. There you go. Oh, and you have a beautiful okay. background. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> although let me change that for the purposes of disclosure and yes, keeping things. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for the the weirdness there in the beginning, everybody. We we're just figuring out some issues with connections. Um, and everyone's filing in, and uh, we're also going to have with us um, uh, Robert Wurzberg. I'll just uh, wait for him to log in. Um, this is, first of all, welcome everybody to the Sarah Little Turnball Visiting Designer Speaker Series. This is the 2022 edition, the year that we really, we're really going to do it this year. <laughs> this is going to be everyone's year. Um, uh, this year, uh, this semester, I should say, is um, a little different than past uh, iterations of the lecture series insofar as it is really here to support a class uh, that, that is running right now. That class is physically downstairs. I am physically upstairs in the same building. And we're just trying to sort of, it's like a weird, it's, it's a weird sort of hybrid of both in-person class and remote lecture series never done this before so it's um it's very bizarre but uh but it looks to be like we're we're in a good place uh robert wurzberg he's the person teaching this class that i just mentioned uh, i am inviting him to be a panelist and here he comes and i will make him a co-host as well and, and then i can introduce everybody um if you've never been to the Sarah Little Turnbull uh, Visiting Design Lecture Series, uh, I'm here to tell you that this is a space where we talk about, we talk with various luminaries in the world of design, art, the sciences, uh, in this case, philosophy, uh, activism. Uh, and th this is the very first time we've ever talked to a philosopher. So it's very interesting for me because I love philosophy. I usually can't avoid having a philosophical conversation. Uh, Robert is the same way. Um, oh, and it looks like my uh, my signage is reversed. Is that still the case? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's so embarrassing. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> let me see if I can. Um, oh, actually, let me. Does this fix it? No. Did no. it mirror oh. my screen? Did that not? No, that my did video? the video. That's what I just did, and it didn't mm. seem to. Hey, I recognize that. Let me just, um, yeah, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to export an entirely new version and upload it. This is just how good I am at uh, design work. So if you ever need like a freelancer, I'm here for y'all. Okay. Is that better? Perfect. Yay. Illustrated to the rescue. Okay. So uh, we talk a lot of a lot of different things in this lecture series, uh, but usually running through it all is a philosophical undercurrent. Like, why do we design? What does designing mean? What does it mean to be a person of color in design? What does it mean to be a woman in design? These are philosophical questions. Um, this semester, we're going to be focusing on this looming and very current 
uh, climate crisis that uh, we as a planet and as a species face um, through the lens of not just philosophy, but through environmental justice, uh, science, obviously, uh, sound design, fine arts, um, the history of conservation, and of course, design as well. Uh, this series is also running, and this class is running concurrently with Echo Urgency, Now or Never. It's the current exhibition in the Lehman College Art Gallery, and it asks visitors to think about the impact of the climate crisis through art. Uh, and this exhibition, just so you know, closes on April 23rd, so make sure you uh, make appointments to come see it before that happens. Um, the, as I mentioned, this is also uh, this lecture series, a direct component of an interdisciplinary design course uh, in climate design. It's paired designers, uh, design students with science students to create a more holistic response to climate change. So it's, it's, it's very much in line with the exhibition in the um, in the Lehman College Art Gallery. These students are here today. Actually, they're in the they're, they're participants. They they have come to talk with us and hopefully be interacting with us with, through the Q and A. And also, this lecture series, as all previous ones and all future ones, are open to the public. So anyone who's watching is welcome to ask questions through the Q&A. There's a little Q&A function. This is distinct from the chat, by the way. Uh, the Q&A, the chat's like more in informal. The Q&A is the more formal, uh, it, it sort of accrues questions and then we can kind of go through them and, and answer them. Uh, before I introduce my, my two uh, guests here, uh, I just want to thank Dorothy Dunn and the Sarah Little Turnbull Foundation for their generous and continued support of the design program here uh, and, and the art department and the arts and humanities in general. Um, it has been, as I think both James and Robert can attest, been particularly important during the pandemic where we're sort of, we're not sure what to do anyway. And this has sort of been, for me anyway, like a, a touchstone, like something I can do to sort of keep grounded. And um, it's been it's been incredible. So thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna introduce our guest, uh, James Mayen, but before I do, I just want to quickly introduce Robert Wurzberg uh, in the mask. Uh, so, because uh, he's in the classroom, right? He is the teacher of record for this climate design class. Uh, he's an adjunct professor, professor of 2D animation here at Lehman. Um, he, uh, he was uh, in the MEA, he also teaches at the MEA program at BMCC. Um, he's a children's book author, illustrator. He's a professional animator. That's how I met him um more than 15 years ago now or something like that he spent the last 30 years in one of the the front lines of advancing changes to our ecosystem actually stewarding a forest land use program and wildlife ha wildlife habitat in northern vermont so he knows of which he speaks when it comes to climate change and stewardship all the things we're going to be dancing and talking about uh dancing around and discussing directly during this uh, lecture series and so thank you robert for being here um uh, and now our speaker, we're very honored and thrilled to have the hardest working man in higher ed. He's our, our very own Dean of Arts and Humanities, Dr. James Mann. Um, as the Dean, of Arts and, uh, the Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities here at Lehman, Dr. Mann oversees nine academic departments offering 30 majors, 43 minders, uh, and eight master's degree programs. He's also a member of the board of the CUNY Mexican Studies Institute he collaborates with the Lehman College Art Gallery, uh, the City and Humanities Program, the Center for Human Rights and Peace Studies, and the CUNY Institute for Irish American Studies. He has a BA from Trinity College in Dublin, uh, a master's, master's in philosophy uh, from the University of Cambridge, a PhD from Duke, uh, and he is actually a professor of philosophy and the former chair of the philosophy department here at Lehman College, which that, when I met you, that's what you, you, you know, that's what you were. Uh, and his fields of interest are moral philosophy, the history of moral philosophy, and early modern philosophy, which is right in the pocket of what we're going to be talking about today. So it's perfect. Um, he's also the executive, recently the executive producer of Shift NYC, a recent series of public service announcements that I, helped, I was working on uh, for the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. It just broadcast in November, and you can check that out on the Lehman website use Lehman students, we all got together, we made this during the pandemic, it was another 
another in, in, you know great touchstone that we got to work together. Um, and it was produced here at the Multimedia Center at Lehman College, and it showed how various businesses and industries and institutions kind of made it and adapted to the the, the COVID-19 pandemic and, and thrived all throughout the five boroughs. Uh, Dr. Mann's recent publications include Novels Never Lie and Contemporary Approaches to the Philosophy of Lying. So lots about lying. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, James. Thank you so much for, for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, David, and it's good to see you and Robert uh, once again. Um, these uh, Turnbull-sponsored uh, talk seminars have kept us going uh, throughout these uh, times. So uh, I'm delighted to be joining today as a speaker and uh, ready, I guess, to talk about some of the philosophy behind environmental questions, problems, and uh, I don't claim to be an expert on the area of the environment, but uh, I am interested in it as we apply basically ethics to questions about the environment and climate change. So that's why I'm here. Great. So did you want to, you, you wanted to present some stuff, right? Well, I, or do I you did. just want to have a conversation? Like, what do you, what do you prefer? Well, there was a question that you asked me in advance of, of today that I thought was really um, kind of playing into my interests, um, yeah. which was a question about, you know, we took a path, it seems, uh, in history. Um, you might want to say the path was in the 17th century yeah. um, in which we, um, with the development of modern science, we maybe moved away from thinking about the natural world as we did in, in previous times and moved into a way of thinking about the world that was, um, we might say now, very alienating. Um, so I, I do the history of philosophy and in doing that i i work on the area of rene descartes and right um, this this is how this came up like we were in class and we were talking about there he is there's the guy yeah, we were talking rene. about you know robert said we have this very subjective relationship with nature right and and it sort of has separated us from a responsibility to our environment and I guess my question for you is, and this came right out of class, like how, what is our responsibility as individuals versus the society we live in, the state, for example, you know, and that's really where, and it, does it go back to Descartes? And if so, how do we remediate this? Well, it, it, it may go back to Descartes or, or some of it may go back to Descartes. So, so Descartes is, is one of my favorite, Descartes, French philosopher, 17th century, mm -hmm. author of The Meditations, which, by the way, you may never see this again, but this is a copy oh, of wow. the second edition of the Meditations from 1642 with the seventh set of replies. So, um, wow. uh, 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 yeah, I, I don't just talk the talk. I, I really do. Just, just the second edition, though? Come on. Yeah, because the second <laughs> edition is the first complete edition. Ah, uh, I see. Um, but Descartes really did offer in a, a new way of thinking about the entire world and new metaphysics. Descartes divided the world into souls right. and the rest, which is just all body or bodies. It didn't even matter that much to him that you could chop up the body of the world into bodies. So you had a soul, which was the thinking immortal um, identity. Uh, each individual person has a unique immortal soul. And that connects with a piece of nature, which is the body that you have some control over in some way that he never explained. Or by if you have a thought, your arm goes up. And if you bang your arm, somehow you can observe that the arm has been damaged and you have a feeling of pain. So the world is divided into the souls and bodies. Um, so nature, what is nature? What is the non-soul? Well, the non-soul is just all extended stuff. Right. And since it doesn't have any soul, it doesn't have any thought, it doesn't have any experience, it doesn't have any sensation. 
So that may seem okay if you're talking about a mountain, right? No thought, no sensation. It may still be okay if you talk about a tree, no thought, no sensation. But when you talk about an animal, it's pretty severe. So Descartes was famous for claiming that animals are just machines, the, the bête machine hypothesis, that animals are unfeeling, unthinking automata that mm. move around inside the other non-thinking, non-feeling rocks and so forth. So with a perspective on the world in which the only beings that have pain or pleasure are the souls that are connected to inanimate bodies, with the idea that the entire world is not even really alive, um, for him yeah. the entire world is, is not animated because you need a soul to be animated, then the entire world is just like a great big artificial machine. And when you are faced with an entire artificial theme park of a world, you basically decide to use it as will benefit you in some way. So you could right. tear things down if you wanted to get materials that would help you to do things that would make you have various kinds of exper experiences. You could certainly decide to cut things up. Uh, you can happily go ahead and do experiments on creatures because basically they're all without thought or without sensation or feeling. Um, so I did, I did um, recently hear about a, a mock conspiracy theory called birds don't exist in which right. the claim was that the government at one point in the 50s they basically got rid of all the, they killed all the birds and re they replaced the birds with drones that are monitoring us and, and I thought well the joke is actually according to Descartes the joke is on the government because all animals are drones every single animal is a drone for Descartes so you can do with the world as you will um, now that's the most I would say the most alienated perspective that you can possibly have yeah. on the world. And this, so, this, has, yeah. this has precedent in the Judeo-Christian tradition as well. This is just our, a more rational, rationalist approach to it. You're absolutely yeah. right. So the Judeo-Christian tradition basically looks upon the world as there for us to right. uh, use and exploit according to, um, it's kind of a gift for us, or it's a resource for us. Um, and thinking of the entire world merely as our resource is, is what I would say is the worst perspective to have. And the perspective that we worry is the perspective of essentially the corporate world. It's just, like, a, everything just, is just a resource. Well, just one question about that, yeah. though. Uh, is it is it true to say that he it was presaged by Judeo Christianity, or would it be more accurate to say that Descartes was trying to reconcile Judeo Christianity with this new rationalism and the invention of science? What do you where do you fall on that? Interesting. So the question for me is um, obviously there's a tradition whereby the world is there for our use. Uh, essentially, the world is of only instrumental value to us. Um, but did Descartes sort of start out wanting to defend that, or? Was it just yeah. a mere conclusion to his metaphysics? My suspicion is it was just a mere conclusion to his metaphysics. But interestingly, of all the things he argued, that the thesis that animals are merely machines that don't sense or feel pain or even joy or anything, that was the most controversial mm. part or the, result, most con the most controversial consequence of his theory. And in fact, philosophers in England, the Cambridge Platonists, were so upset with this that they argued vociferously that animals have animal souls. That way we got to include them in the moral community in some sense. Um, so that was how extreme they had to, uh, they had to adopt a stance to create animal souls. So I'm, I'm of the view that it was not what he set out to do, but it's the result of his metaphysics that nothing has value except souls. Right. This sort of okay. plays off of Oscar Wilde's uh, his opinion, which, you know, was that, that, that um, uh, you know, uh, we didn't start really noticing the fog and the noticing how much fog there was until, you know, the impressionists came along and started, you know, blurring the light and things like that. And, you know, he, he had a whole theory, uh, kind of a joke theory about our, our aesthetics, how aesthetics are tied to to these events and that really that's uh, you know they're just there for our benefit and 
and then they're all tied at a certain point. Hmm. He is consistent and not a hypocrite in the following way. When he eats an animal, he's eating merely a, 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 a kind of a squidgy machine. Um, we, if we don't believe that about animals, we have to, <laughs> we have a higher bar to not be hypocrites yeah. because yeah. they're living creatures that can suffer. Did they suffer while they lived and, and did they get slaughtered for us to eat? So, you know, uh, yeah, he's crazily consistent with his theory, but we have to step back and think if we don't think that way about animals, what is the status of animals and the ecosystems in which animals live? Um, if we don't want to elevate ourselves above nature, then how, you know, are we willing to equate ourselves with other creatures and environments? Or do yeah. we still preserve some sort of sense of superiority to them? Well, then let, let me ask you then that if, I know mean, we're long past, especially from philosophical history, we are long past Descartes. Like we've, we've you know, several That's, levels beyond, right? I would hope to think. Uh, where are we now? And like, take us through some of the history of that. Like, we're still in this position where we identified as a class that, we have a subjective relationship to nature and that we're observing it passively and using it to our benefit. That hasn't changed, obviously. That's why we're sitting here talking about this. But the but the theoretical grounding has changed, right? There's reason to I, believe. Well, here is the here's the concern from the philosophical point of view. We certainly have a much more complex understanding now of the natural world and of organisms and of ecosystems. And we don't think of it as being an entirely, you know, mechanical extended thing, but as, as living. And right. we don't necessarily at least think of ourselves as having these metaphysical souls that are distinct from anything natural. But the moral distinction between us as persons and the rest of the environment um, that went along with Descartes metaphysics but I would say that moral difference between us and other organisms uh, mm. is still something that we have uh, preserved a and the question is is there a way of moving from that and there are different yeah. philosophers who have tried to um, you know, not preserve the moral hierarchy between uh, us human beings and other creatures and organisms. But, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. I, I, I did, you know, there are philosophers who have become famous for arguing that at least certain other creatures, and they have in mind primates, should be considered as, as persons, right? Um, and I was actually yeah. rather interested recently to see that when in Atlanta recently, there was the death of the Western Mountain Gorilla at age of 61. It was basically an obituary about yeah. him and his life and his descendants that appeared in the newspaper. So, you know, at that level, there's an attempt by people to make certain animals be legal, legally understood as persons. Um, but that's hard when you're dealing with questions about people wanting to eat certain kinds of foods. And yeah. uh, so, so, the, so certain animals being regarded as persons is, the, is, is something that is more controversial. It's argued for by some, but I think that there's an interesting debate to focus on the, on the animals for a second between philosophers who would say that what we are essentially are to do is to stop their, or not have them suffer so Peter right. Singer is famous for arguing that essentially animals shouldn't be suffering in any way. And that basically removes all factory farming, uh, removes many of our practices and it requires us to be essentially for the most part vegetarians unless we could somehow have them happily living a life in the free range way and then humanely and painlessly their life is over. Yeah. Now that seems like an enlightened view by comparison to Descartes, but uh, you do have philosophers uh, like Francion here, Gary Francion, who argues that no, you're still thinking of the animal community 
as essentially there for you, even if they're not to suffer so much and have a happy life before you end their life and eat them, right? So his veganism uh, and complete opposition to having any pets, having any sort of, you know, horses, race, basically there should only be wild animals. Right. Everything else is basically our looking upon animals as somehow a resource for us to eat or for us to ride on or for us to turn our create handbags out of after they've yeah. had a relatively pleasant life. So, so, so that's a view that says that the relationship that we should have with environment is at the very least that we should all be vegan. So, you know, that's certainly stepping away from the moral superiority of human beings to other other natural creatures, but not many people are willing to go the route of well, being vegan. So let me stop you there. I'm yeah. not even sure it's necessarily a be, a, be it's about willingness. I uh -huh. I mean I for example, if I wanted to be vegan and there have been times I want to and I could do it. I know I could do it. I have the physical capability to do it. Right. My constitution is such that I could live on plants and a plant-based diet. But it's hard because of social norms. If I go out to eat, you know, it's only recently that there are vegan items on the menu, right? That's a very recent thing. Uh, uh, it would have been an oddity when I was growing up as a child and I had no real agency about what I ate anyway. And my point is, is that there's this, um, there's this overwhelming myth in American culture, which we've talked about in the lecture series before, but it runs in every conversation. I eventually get to this, where there's this myth of American individualism as being like the prime motivator and, and the most important value we have as a, as a country is our individualism. And that we're all a, ser we're, we're a collection of individuals that make our own individual choices. Um, and we all have personal responsibility for everything we do, right? I say myth because our, our federal, state and local governments play a huge role in mediating our lives. Right, and in, in the case of something like climate change, individuals are, li are literally powerless. Like we have to come to work, we have to go to the store, or if people have to bring us our groceries from the store, as we've seen during the pandemic, we have to use automobiles and it's not our fault, right? The, the automobile industry in this country is, I don't know, 130 years old now. And they were wonderful inventions when, when, they, when they came about. Um, but they were heavily subsidized, right? The federal, the, the federal government put like around 25 million into the roads, the building of roads throughout the United States, which I think ultimately is a good thing. It's a necessary thing. And then just recently, I mean, that's a pretty, that's a hundred years ago, but recently during the 2008 uh, financial crisis, they gave something like, you know, 80, you know, something like, um, I wanna say 23 or 25 billion to General Motors and Chrysler, two of the big three car companies, just to keep them afloat because they were, you know, quote unquote, too big to fail. That's where this terminology comes from. It was like 20% of all the, the money that was handed out, the, the, um, the bailout, if you will, went to automobile companies. So the, the, the state does heavily mediate uh, automobile comp companies and our agricultural system that forces crap on us and, and you know forces like the use of monoculture and and uh, all kinds of other evils, uh, you know things that have negative consequences. Let's put it that way. So I think it's it, that's where the myth comes from. There, we're taught this myth. We're force fed this myth that it's our responsibility to recycle and to eat animal, you know, to to eat uh, ethically, to do to act ethically in response to the the climate crisis. But we we don't stand a chance is, is my feeling. And I think, you know, I, how do you, I mean, what, what do you think about that? So, yeah, I, I agree that um, the idea that we are all sort of to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and change all of our practices and adjust to having completely new, new diets and yeah. um, to never fly, <laughs> to, uh, to not yeah, never fly, fly, never fly to, I mean, I, I have, colleagues in, in, in philosophy who refuse to fly to any conferences or travel, you know, for pleasure, as it were, um, using mm -hmm. flying because they just think it's unjustified. So I do agree that asking every individual 
to make all of those changes um, is basically at some level unfair. Um, yeah. The question I think that is pushed by philosophers like the animal abolitionists like Francione and, and even by Singer who has a weaker position is that there may be things that we can change in our lives that are not giving up a huge amount um, and yet can make a, a huge difference. I didn't realize this until recently and I was sort of reading a story about um, this is a, a, a bald eagle suffering from lead poisoning. Oh God. Now, um, even, first of all, Descartes clearly wrong because that's clearly an animal in some, in some kind of- pain, Serious pain, unable yeah. to breathe. But lead poisoning in, 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 in bald eagles and, and golden eagles, lead poisoning is often the result of, of lead in carcasses shot by hunters. And guess what? They had that problem with lead getting into the water supply with people shooting um, waterfowl with, with lead bullets. And they replaced those with steel bullets. Mm. And now they're campaigning to have hunters only use copper or steel bullets, which don't poison the carcasses such that the um, eagles suffer. So there's a, there's a step. Who would have thought copper bullets are the way forward for being uh, having a better relationship with the environment. So I think that there are going to be things that we can do that will actually help. But I think that at some larger level, um, you are going to require, you're going to need the state to intervene. Yeah. So the state will have to subsidize food that is produced in a way that's um, ethically sound. The state will have to yeah. subsidize alternatives and things like that. So I think we, we, will, we would need that. Fuels will have to be as um, available and as cheap if there are alternatives to fossil fuels for us to heat our homes and maybe even um, to power our electric vehicles. Yeah, so, that's another thing. Fuel and energy sources in general are already heavily subsidized. They come to us through government, uh, government agreements from other countries. They come to us through government for like a raft of tax breaks and so it's this argument that, you know, you know, if you make the, the government responsible, it turns us into some kind of nanny state is completely fallacious to me because the government already, corporations are the nanny state. They're the beneficiaries of a nanny state already, right? So, you know, it, my point in this question ultimately is, is it really our, as individuals, our responsibility as citizens or is it the responsi responsibility of corporations who are by far the biggest beneficiaries and also the biggest actors in terms of uh, pollution? Um, and then therefore the government in terms of po public policy. They're either on our side, the government, or they're on corporation side. I don't want to get into a whole you know, discussion about that. That's a different discussion. Well, I would say clearly corporations are able to buy governments. I mean, they're yeah. able to buy votes, they're able to buy policies. They, I don't know that they can buy court decisions, but we, we probably would be able to find some of those too. Sure. Um, I think the point is that corporations are, I mean, as much as we talk about how corporations might develop a conscience, I think that corporations um, will always have to have, you know, um, hanging above them the, the sort of sword of Damocles or some sense of like that they must um, observe policies that are decided by democratically elected and hopefully, um, you know, leaders and, and representatives of, of, of the citizens who, who want them to not be able to get all these breaks and exploit uh, natural resources for their own profit. So I, I think that if we, I think it's probably fair to say that people would like to have uh, corporations, companies, etc., be um, be better, uh, be be as it were more ethical, uh, you know, not uh, destroy entire ecosystems with uh, pollute, pollution. Um, yeah. but the corporations won't do it on their own. They're going to have to be regulated. They're going to have to be punished, and then we have to uh, elect and put in place people who will do that, yeah. and we have to then hold them to account. Um, and protest against what they're doing if they yeah. are being held to account by laws.
so this brings up this question of greenwashing, which is essentially yeah. what it's it's this idea, the same idea of whitewashing or sanitizing history, sanitizing business practices, whatever it is. But in terms of the environment, is this this literally came from a student? This question: In what ways is greenwashing a form of lying? And I thought you'd be a good person to ask that because your specialty is philosophy of lying. Like, is it lying? Is it? It's certainly misleading. I mean, what? How do you feel right. about it? Well, there is a. I mean, so there is a distinction. I, I I do work on the area of what counts as a lie, sort of narrowly understood, where it's a certain kind of uh, act that I have yeah. that I, I'm engaged in with another person, whereby I make an assertion. So I'm serious. I invoke their trust. I am getting them to believe what I'm saying, and I believe what I'm saying is false. Now that's a lie. It may not be exactly what's happening in all cases of greenwashing. But interestingly, there's a there's a distinction that has now become much more important, I think, in the literature and in, in in lies, uh, which is between lies and deception, and then between deception and manipulation. Now people ask the following question. If I sell a product, say I want to sell some, some sort of drug, and I think that it will sell better if the color is blue mm. than if the color is orange, that people will sort of look upon it and be more soothed by it. Uh, famously, you know, McDonald's is supposed to have chosen the colors of red and yellow for their restaurants because it makes you hungry if you look at those colors. Um, so that's manipulation. But is, is McDonald's lying to you about how you're hungry right now, even though you don't think you are? Well, I wouldn't call it lying, but I do call it manipulation. Okay. So I think if we, if we think of it as our companies manipulating, uh, are they saying things that even though some part of them might be correct, essentially it's gross exaggeration such, such that it's misleading people. So misleading and manipulation are definitely practiced by companies. And here's the irony, right? So the company wants to play on your desire for a green product or a greener your product and a greener company. So they exactly. say things like, you know, we're greener than the competitor, right? We we are ethically, we, the source of our this is better. The way that we do this is better. We are uh, not harming the environment as much. So they actually are trying to get you, kind of manipulate your desire for a better world to get you to yep. buy the product. So it's, well, it's terrible, right? <laughs> what about what about the, the the recycling industry, for example, which was really the invention of the plastic industry, mm -hmm. as a, as a way you know, because the recycling is really only a fourteen to twenty percent, you know, success rate. So, it, but it, it basically made people feel like it was okay to continue to buy plastic and make more plastic, even though there's a whole kind of complex consequence to all that. But again, I, 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 the history of, of these is as it's the same perverse history whereby they want they want to take advantage of your interest in a in a greener world and a in a more ethically sound practice, and so they they take advantage of that. They they don't treat you as somebody who doesn't care about the environment. They play upon your caring about the environment in order to get you to do something that will eventually support their business and make them more profits. So uh, so this is, you know, the capitalist system adapting to um, moral beliefs and values of customers, but essentially manipulating them into making decisions that are actually contrary to the final good and to better ethical can, can I can, can I can I ask go back to Descartes a little bit uh, just uh, regarding sort of the reality view of animals. So Liebtraub wrote about this, this idea that, you know, every organism has some way of interacting with the world it lives in. And uh, that we're, we have a very particular way of interacting, which we have a lot of agency in changing the surrounding, which animals or other life forms also do in their own, on their own terms and in their own system. Uh, and they tend to adapt and uh, cohabitate, whereas we tend to, uh, you know, command and destroy sort of our stuff, as I can tell. And right. uh, we don't try to engage that. So if you look at some complex systems, particularly fungi and things like that, 
they're very adaptive to all the life forms around them. And in fact, they're finding that a lot of uh, animals are, are the same way. And, uh, but we don't, we, this is a fairly nuanced uh, sort of approach. I, you know, how do you, how do you look at a, a, a human a species and think how, how, how can we engage in this? Because we've become so far removed. I mean, I think there was probably, you could probably trace human history. You could probably find that at some point there was this kind of co co uh, coordinated relationship, but we don't, we seem to, we've, we've completely removed ourselves from that. And is there any way to reconcile ourselves with that? Either? I mean, although this is like super simplistic history, essentially the Industrial Revolution permanently changed the relationship yeah. that human beings have with yeah. the rest of the world, the natural yeah. world. I mean, once you had the Industrial Revolution, I mean, not that there weren't obviously things that, um, but, but agrarian life was, yeah. was, did much less violence to the environment. I mean, pollution in the way in which we talk about pollution today began with the industrial revolution. Yeah. So, um, so basically we haven't, you know, recovered and we haven't clawed back to uh, a, a sort of a, a relationship with the world that's pre-industrial. And the mm. question that is asked about what we should do going forward is we know this now. I mean, we're fully aware now of the harm that we're doing to the environment. And, and the difference between the concerns of those who are arguing about how we treat animals or how we treat ecosystems even, is that there the, 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 the victims were, were the, were the non-human, um, whether we think of them as equal to us morally, but at least the non-human, what we're talking about now is that we have done things that will harm us, even if we were only selfish, harm us humans, and and this is the harder thing, future generations. So the question becomes, what are our responsibilities to, um, it, it may not be that my carbon emissions harm me now, but right. they will certainly harm future generations. They may harm me later on in my life, um, and they will certainly make the planet worse if we don't do anything about it. Um, so that at some point in the future, people's lives will be very, very different from the life that I can have now. So what is my responsibility to fellow humans, to my future self and to future generations when I consume and consume and consume? Because right now I'm able and free to do so without there being really any kind of penalty. Yeah, I, I think that's a really... I mean, I like how you what you've done is you said it's not necessarily about our res, a responsibility to nature. We can work in this existing framework that we have a responsibility to ourselves. We have an implicit respect for human life. So that being the case, we can rely on that respect for current and future human life and lean in on that with a little bit of pathos to convince people that they have a responsibility, right? Um, but I... I don't know. I, I wonder, see, the issue is that those future, those things in the future are in the future. We can't see them now, right? And, and we, we're, we can be told whatever we want. People can tell us that the sea levels are going to rise in some places. Uh, Manhattan, Florida, the island nations will all be subsumed in the ocean. We could be, we could watch, and you mentioned this too, the polar bears can, you know, be drowning in the ice um, and that that's going to continue and that the ice castle will be gone. We can be told that the, the, um, the Midwest is suffering the worst drought in a thousand years, but it's, you know, the real, this, in other words, the people that are, this is really going to affect aren't born yet. So we can't see them. We don't know them. And it's harder, I think, or, or easier, let's put it that way to just ignore it as a problem because the, those are, they are not in front of us. And I guess my question here is, and really the whole, yeah, the whole point of this class is, is that we're teaching is that we're trying to, through artistic means, to get people to see something that you can't see yet, right? To, to see something that's maybe an abstract and not a, not a tangible thing. And I guess a question that we have for you is, given everything that you said, 
um, our philosophical grounding for all this, some of the problematic issues with our with Western philosophy and and where we are now, now given corporate hegemony. What can artists and scientists do to reframe this 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 relationship and make people understand? I know it's a big question, but well, I, I like the fact that you already um, believe that it's scientists and artists working together. I think that's absolutely crucial. Okay. So there is not, in my view, a fundamental distinction uh, between what's motivating the scientists who are concerned with and knowledgeable about uh, the environment and what's motivating the artists. Um, scientists are on this scientists, not 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 companies and corporations that make use of scientific breakthroughs to exploit. Right. But scientists are are much more informed and knowledgeable about the basically the fragile fragility of the world and the what we have to do to go about saving it. So I, I did I did change my background to the famous photograph taken by the Apollo eight astronaut um, of planet Earth seen from the moon. This is the photograph known, known as Earthrise, right. uh, which was taken on Christmas Eve in six, 1968 and then published in Scientific American. And what I didn't realize fully about that story is that as it was published in 1970, that was the year that we first had Earth Day, uh, April hmm. 22nd, 1970. And um, that was in my opinion, a, a, a gestalt shift, a shift in, in, uh, in people's thinking about the earth because they suddenly saw the earth as being kind of vulnerable, uh, fragile, okay. uh, not, not indestructible, not sort of there no matter what we do, it will always be around and we always have you know, blue seas and oxygen. Right. No, no, they, 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 it, it is something that we have to protect and we have to look after and care for. As they famously argue today, there is no planet B, there is no second planet. You yeah. Know, despite what Elon Musk and a couple of billionaires are trying to convince you of, right. basically the Earth is it. So, so if we could, if 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 artists and scientists together are able to show essentially the either doubting or 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 you know maybe they're just. Um, they're, they're, they're not committed either way. They're, they're sort of ambivalent or they're, they think, I'll wait and see. If you can convince those people that actually they have to step up and do things for the planet to get better, that they have to step up and, and participate in, in a community with the rest of the planet, then I think joining that sort of sense, having a sense of community with others to actually, quote unquote, save the planet is how this could Work and I was thinking about how that campaign for having Earth Day and for uh, even though it was maybe a little bit, little bit nationalistic to think of it as being kind of what was best for America or keep America beautiful, but there was that famous ad campaign which was the mm -hmm. even though this was an actor and not an actual uh, indigenous yeah. American, the tear falling down the cheek as he looks upon the city kind of trashing, you know, people throwing. It was an anti-litter campaign, but essentially it was, we must respect and have an attitude towards the, 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 the world that is basically more of a view of us being in a relationship that respects the world. I mean, reverence or sacredness is sometimes understood as, as what it would be to have a relationship that's very different from the one that we have. And I think that the, um, this was a, 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 a short ad that was yeah. played on television. People today remember this ad. I know some people who say after that ad, I stopped throwing litter on the ground. You know, it was like <laughs> so. But but interestingly, it was what it, yeah, it was effective. Yeah. I mean, it, maybe it was manipulative, but it was sure. definitely effective. And the question we have is: okay, so we have artists who are doing things uh, today, and are they sort of able to sort of make us think about the world in a way that brings us back to um, the reality of what's happening? This is um, a Chinese dissident artist who um, is, is basically working to try to preserve Brazilian, uh, Brazilian forests. And his art consists of making iron molds of uh, trees, uh, the, the, the particular um, 
tree that uh, the pequeet tree that's basically under threat of extinction. So he makes replicas of those trees, and that's the art exhibit. Or in a in a in a smaller space, he he makes a mold of the roots of the pequeet mm. tree, and he brings you face to face with a growing extinct, uh, uh, absolutely beautiful uh, uh, organism. And, and, and that's supposed to shock you into realizing that um, this is going to be the end of that species uh, if we don't do something about what's happening in, in, in the rainforest in, in Brazil. So, so the, the, the scientist with the photograph, the first color, color photograph of the moon, the artist with the uh, reproduction of a tree, um, and all the things that happen in between, these are ways for artists and scientists yeah. to bring home how essentially it's up to us. It's not invulnerable. It's not going to be there forever. Uh, we have a certain amount of time, as the exhibition says, now or never. We have a certain yeah. amount of time, and we will, if we don't, if we don't take steps, we will lose whole yeah. parts of our planet. We have we have some questions here uh, yeah. from the audience. And actually, Dorothy Dunn reminds us that um, Robert Rauschenberg was actually one of the founders of Earth Day. So one of the most famous late 20th century artists of all time. Uh, but one question that pops up here is, how uh, do you feel the philosophy of Descartes is related to his religion of the 17th century? Can you explain how in the reality of today's environment in our relationship as humans to animals is utilized in Descartes' theory? So, I mean, it's true that um, Descartes' uh, division of the world into the souls and everything else was consistent with uh, a certain interpretation of Christianity and more particularly Catholicism, according to which there was a moral superiority uh, of um, the, 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 the immortal souls uh, over everything else. I, I think that um, what, interestingly, the, the, the uh, astronaut, Anders, who took that photograph, he said that it changed his religious views. He actually became, as he said, more of a Buddhist. Mm. Um, and now he, he actually is interested in reading works by kind of, you know, I suppose contemporary atheists. Um, I don't know that it has to be the case that you have to sort of give up on a religious view. I think that you might have to give up on a certain kind of Western religious view, perhaps, to yeah. have appropriate relationship with the rest of the planet. I think that we talked about indigenous peoples and having a different relationship to the planet. So those protesting, for example, against the um, oil pipe pipeline in Dakota, right? Yeah. That was a protest against the pipeline running through um, what was sacred ground. It was yeah. also the case that they argued that it was possibly polluting the water supply. So yes. there is a spiritual relationship um, that protects the environment, but it also protects the people. And I think that the extra thing that we would give to this, which isn't in Descartes, is um, this is a political uh, point as well, because the pipeline is going to not run through the wealthier parts of the country. The pipeline is not going to uh, right. jeopardize the, the uh, wonderful sort of, you know, I guess the shoreline in that Part of Florida. No, it's by cop, it's by pop communities that are affected. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Those are the yeah. communities that will that will bear the the, the costs and yeah. take the risks of these. Even if that pipeline, by the way, were as people argued, the safest way to transport oil. I mean, even if we agreed that it's better than overground trucks to have a pipeline, mm -hmm. have the pipeline run through every single backyard in the entire country. You yeah. know, uh, uh, things, uh, things would change. Honor, then, then tell me about the risks and the benefits, you know. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, in Judaism, there's really nothing in Judaism that says that the planet exists for our, our, our gain. In fact, Judaism has this principle called tikkun olam, which is kind of, it kind of translates as uh, to repair the world. Like it's just, it's this fun founding principle of, of Judaism, which is to to keep the world uh, pristine for future generations, which is exactly what we're talking about, stewardship, right? 
And um, and of course, uh, Hillel, which is like, in, he was like a first century, um, he basically began the Talmud and, and the, the all, you know, the, the next 2000 years of Judaism after the first century, he, he wrote the book essentially. He, he said that really all Judaism boils down to is do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which could easily transfer to our understanding of nature and the environment. Um, and then in Christianity, I, I can't, I mean, I, I didn't really go to church often. Uh, maybe you did more than I did, but I don't remember anything about in the gospels about Jesus saying anything about exploiting nature or using, you know, the beasts of the field to our own gain. That is not his, that was just wasn't part of his philosophy. It wasn't even centered in that. So I wonder like, you know, when we say that this all just stems from Ju Judeo-Christianity, what do we really mean? I don't want to spend too much time on that, but but it's like an it's interesting Old question. Testament. It's Old Testament rather than New Testament, I think at, okay. at a minimum. But I think the idea that sort of the, the bountiful nature is there and that we should go forth and multiply. You know, there are at least some philosophers who would there say, it is. Yeah. oh, no, don't go forth and multiply. Not if that means that you're going to, I mean, one way of understanding what has happened with respect to environments. Um, I mean, I'm thinking about this when I think about, you know, the issue of, of the fitting animals into our lives. I mean, essentially what we did was we colonized the planet yeah. so that all the other animals are the result of our colonization, right? And yeah. so they're indigenous animals and we have colonized their habitats. So the question becomes, if all of this is somehow there for us, which was the, I think, the, 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 and, the Old Testament view, yeah. The old te if it's all there for us, then there's a problem. Even if you were to try to take care of it, you're still ultimately, you're the, you're the shepherd, right? There's a joke in, the, in Plato's Republic about this, right? So, oh, the sheep are protected by the shepherd, really? I thought at the end of the day, they get killed after <laughs> they're protected by the shepherd. So, you know, that, that doesn't seem to work. So, um, you know, the shepherd is basically making a profit ultimately from yeah. the sheep. Now, I have Extracting, farmers, yeah. farmers who would adamantly disagree with this. And to all of my relatives oh, back home in Ireland, true. you know, I, I, I think you can be a good shepherd. But there is this kind of question about whether everything is there in some ultimate sense for us. And I think the difference is, and I don't want to speak about matters about which I don't know with respect to other uh, sets of beliefs, but I don't think that viewing certain parts of the world or nature as sacred is the same thought. I think that's a different thought. That is giving yeah. a certain status to the world, the natural world and creatures in the world that is not the status of there for us or even there for us to protect. It's like there for us to respect. And that's going yeah. to way in respecting. We can't go there. We can't um, do that. In, in New Zealand, they have taken the step, which is basically a kind of a legal maneuver that just as there are communities that have a reverence for parts of, the, the, of nature, they have made certain rivers be understood legally as persons mm -hmm. and, and that's essentially giving the status of person to nature so yeah. imagine if you had the view that all of nature was another person or all of nature was a collection of persons we were literally going the it, this is the opposite from descartes that the rest of the world is as much souls as you are right yeah what kind of relationship if you walked out the door today what would be the relationship with, with your environment if, if you thought of it all as being a collection oh, of persons? And a, it's and a criminal act to do anything that harms any of that. Yeah. It's, it's right. Yeah. So, so we, we have a legal system that, that doesn't make it a crime to right. harm <laughs> nature per se. Right. If it's somebody's property, okay. If it's a protected thing because we want to look at it, okay. But not at, for itself. So it would be up to having a change in the in, in our laws that would stop us from doing those things. It's funny because we have we have settled law in this country in the United States that treats essentially treats corporations like people. Yes. Right. It, it, yeah. it get, and I just meant this was a question that somebody had asked in the Q and A, and I answered that because of the Citizens United uh, Supreme Court decision. Corporations essentially have the same rights as you and I do to donate. To the political campaigns so it's almost like we've gone the opposite way as new zealand i know that's not a big news flash but uh 
it's something to think about. I, I would encourage everybody to read up on that particular decision. But I also had this question. This is you, see, you mentioned that in the Old Testament, we're, we're given this this um, prerogative to go forth and multiply, almost like an early manifest, a proto manifest destiny. Yeah. And and there's a question here. I'm wondering if you could speak to the ethics of individual responsibility in reference in, in reference to achieving zero population growth. Because this is something we did not talk about. Right. Right. Yeah. Um. I mean, this is where you know, this is where some people's views uh, about what we need to do to protect the environment will will come into conflict with very strong intuitions that they have about yeah. things like family size. Now, um, I think that the US in particular, and I, 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 if you, this connects with a much wider debate, the US in particular seems to enshrine um, having, uh, essentially having children, having families, um, without it being the case that they believe that the state should invest in supporting families or without them thinking about the yeah. repercussions of um, having children, having families, as it were, increasing the number of humans, taking over. The, they don't seem to have, maybe because in the US, and I speak as somebody who it wasn't born in the US, because they think of it as being kind of an endless supply of land, and why would you worry? But actually, you know, other countries, this is a fundamental problem politically, mm -hmm. that they um, are worried about their populations. Mm -hmm. um, and that they restrict population growth and, and how many children you can have. So I think that the U.S. is um, free, apparently, of these concerns. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a concern that I think is something that will, will become more of a concern. Um, and yet, interestingly, it's in tension with a growth in, in uh, people sort of delaying having families and um, having smaller uh, numbers of, of, of children in the end. So, so actually you've got um, it being the case that people are in this situation, not necessarily by, by choice, but by yeah. having to sort of live in a capitalist system in which they have to pursue careers and make money. So, so I don't know what the, I don't know what the, what the solution will be to this, but I do think that it should never be the case that we think that we don't have to ask those questions. And I've had students write on this. There are philosophers who argue, for example, that we should, um, there's, there's an extreme position held by some philosophers, which is that basically we should remove ourselves. We should stop you know, reproducing, end the humans, let the planet get back to its job of yeah. having, the planet would be a lot better without us. You know, yeah. um, I, I, that's the extreme position, but I think that, the the the, the reality the moral truth is probably somewhere in the middle not just yeah rampant, whatever but i i do remember during yeah. the pandemic my my nephew made the point that for a time there the animals were happier right because the humans were indoors they weren't polluting the atmosphere they weren't flying they weren't driving yeah. <laughs> um and and it was it was nicer for them for that period of time so um yeah. you know maybe a future in which we give them more um freedom and space and, and respect their, um, I, I guess, their lives, uh, and we restrict our own in some way, you know, maybe that's not a bad thing to think about. But yeah, yeah, uh, it's, it's just interesting. Uh, uh, there's this comment, I wonder if instilling reverence is helpful. Does reverence set one apart? I mean, this idea of, I mean, artists are great at this, right? telling stories and instilling reverence for things that maybe otherwise we wouldn't making an emotional connection with something and and feeling respect for it right. that might be a really good solution so so i think reverence is used because people want well people writing about what that means want that word because it's going to convey something much stronger mm -hmm. than than just that you are kind of not going to harm there is a sense in which when I was a child watching, you know, the likes of, I mean, basically for us nature programs, but it was um, David Attenborough and Life, Life on Earth. Yeah. When I watched the entire life history of that animal or that insect or that butter, I don't know if reverence is the word, but it was something much closer to reverence and understanding what it had to go through yeah. um, in order to get 
to be born or get to, to fly or get to eat and survive. So I think that if we understood a lot more about the complexity um, uh, of our environment, um, again, whether, whether we achieve reverence, we certainly achieve something like an incredible respect. And I would argue um, in thinking of it as being um, so complicated and um, so difficult, and yet it, it manages nevertheless to, to survive and flourish, that you would have an attitude very different from the kind of attitude you have towards basically walking into a supermarket and seeing everything there just sort of wrapped up in plastic for you, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the way that we encounter a lot of the, the natural world is, is wrapped up in plastic in a bag for us to purchase in a store. And, you know, that's something that is never going to give you any kind of reverence for anything. So yeah. I, I would I would like to have us be more informed. And even though it's it's crazy to think of social media being a help because social media, as we know, is so problematic. But social media videos about um, the struggles of animals uh, to to save you know some young from a passing car and to rush. I mean, basically, it's anthropomorphic, but it actually does make you think more about. Yeah the world and i think that you know, more of that would actually create something like a sense of i know so much more now about the life of uh the life of, of say wild pigs that yeah doesn't seem like a ham sandwich is really worth it anymore because of what i'm doing to those creatures yeah well this has been this has been great this has been exhaustive uh mm -hmm. i think we've we've covered a lot of ground Robert, did you have any other questions for James or any other comments? No, I, think we, I think I think you got it. I mean, I, I was I couldn't yeah. help but think about um, Constable, the painter Constable worked with a uh, scientist to sort of develop. He, he was fascinated with clouds and he, you know, he spent a lot of time, I, I think he spent his early years as a sort of the, the, the meteorologist for his father's mill to keep track of the, the weather that was coming in. And so he became a specialist in clouds. And then he kind of transferred that over to some scientists that he knew. And that was the, you know, the age of enlightenment and the age of wonder and this sort of stuff. And I'm wondering, I can't help but think that, you know, there was an optimism there to it, right? Yeah. And then, of course that evolved into the industrial revolution and better living through chemistry. And um, which in the consequences of that, and, um, and it, it, it makes me think about what, how, how artists, what, what's the role that artists can play in that process now, which is not, and not to undo that, but to sort of transition um, to, with scientists to, to sort of a different approach to nature. Yeah, I, I, I think, so I, I said, I, I do believe that artists and scientists work together ultimately on this. I, I believe that, that the, the, mo the right orientation and motivation are, are in people who are paying attention to the details and, and, and learning uh, about the reality and not essentially accepting uh, what they have, what they're being told by, by, the, by the corporations. So uh, scientists um, are not driven by the corporate capitalist uh, project um, and, and uh, artists aren't either. And so yeah. um, I think that um, with respect to climate change, for example, right? How is it that we get people to believe that climate change for the for the for the deniers or for the complacent? Uh, how is it that artists and scientists work together? Well, let's begin by saying that one of the good things is that your course <laughs> is bringing together, <laughs> as far as I recall, from when we approved the course, the course is bringing together art students and students in yep. the environmental and and earth sciences. So one way would be to not divide up the learning. Yep. Uh, so that you only did the science or you only did the art, right? It would yeah. be great to see that be part of the curriculum in, in school and in college so that, you know, art was not something alien and, and science wasn't something frightening. Um, and then with more shared understanding of the world and its complexity and its, let's be clear, its beauty, uh, you know, maybe there won't be, there won't be the same sort of audience for yeah. for the let's just destroy this and make a lot of money um I, I would like to see them working together and a course in lehman that brings them together and an art gallery exhibition that is featuring artists 
um, on yeah. the matter of, of the threat to the, the planet and having people attend that exhibition, so sign up. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, that surely is the right step, even if there are other steps to take. Yeah, that's why, again, I just want to reiterate our thanks to the Turnbull Foundation, because again, like this kind of class would have just, I mean, I, I can imagine proposing this class 10 years ago. I mean, it would have been hilarious, uh, the conversation <laughs> that followed, but, uh, and demeaning and, you know, disappointing, but it wouldn't have gone anywhere. So with their help, we've been able to do these crazy, bizarre things that never would have happened before. And it turns out it's not really even that crazy and bizarre, right? It's already in the ether. It's already a necessary conversation that we're just kind of tapping into. Yeah. So thanks to them. Thank you, James, for, for spending you. time. I really appreciate for allowing us to have this course. That's also, thank you. Uh, and thanks to Robert for, for helping us with the course and weighing in. And, uh, and thanks to everybody for coming and watching and asking some pretty tough, but really interesting questions. Uh, thanks, thanks again. And, and please um, join us next week. We'll be talking with Juliana Monte, who also at Lehman, but she is a scientist who is also gonna be talking about environmental justice. So there's kind of like a mixture of two different silos of information blended together so thank you again see you guys next week and uh we'll talk then okay thank you bye-bye